Well, hello everybody on the uh, World Wide Web around the world. We appreciate you being here and the students in class today. We have a nice uh, gathering here today on a very cold Sunday morning. We hope all of you enjoyed your Christmas holidays or whatever that you celebrate. I heard in the Netherlands they do it for two days, so that's pretty cool. I do it the whole month long. So. <laughs> But they, they uh, had their gathering together twice in, in the Netherlands, so I think that's pretty neat. But it was a wonderful time. The important thing that we want to remember is that Christmas is not just a holiday. Christmas is our life. What Jesus came to do for us to bring life to us and Christ to us is very exciting. I saw a sign uh, the day before yesterday on a church, and it really saddened me. Twice they they X they used the X for Christmas. I couldn't believe a church would do that. You know, but if that's what they want to do, that's fine. I want to wrap up. I was going to do it last week, but I ran out of time. The preacher got hold of me. But I want to wrap up with the Queen of Sheba. Then we may go into the next lesson. She gathers her food from afar. I passed it out here. Those of you on the internet, I've already sent it out to you. And so I encourage you to study it. I re it's really interesting. I get emails quite often when I send different chapters out. And uh, somebody will say, that chapter was the most awesome, most wonderful writing that you've ever done. <laughs> you know, and then I'll get one on another one, and somebody else will send an email and say, of all the writings you've ever done, that was the best chapter you've ever done. And I'm excited to hear that because it's touching that person. Yes. And I believe, I hope every one of you have had one particular chapter in this study that's really gripped you. I mean, I hope all of it does. But usually you'll have one particular point that just really grabbed all of you that helps you have that twinkle in the eye experience. So we're going to continue in on, uh, continue on in this. I think there's probably going to be, after, after the one I passed out today, maybe three or four more. I'm not in a big hurry. And then we're going to teach the Song of Solomon. And we're just going to continue on studying the different women in the Bible and see how our brain is just becoming whole and lining up with the mind of Christ. That's what we need, right? So I'm going to back up just a little bit. I left off last week uh, uh, where I said I like what it says next. There was no spirit in her. When the Queen of Sheba had all of her questions answered, it said there was no spirit in her. And when you look at the word spirit there, it's her, her mind, her intellect, her conscious uh, intellect. Uh, there was no more questions is what really what that was saying. Uh, what spirit is in the brain? What spirit's in the intellect? Well, it's the, the information that we receive from uh, the cosmos system. It's the information we receive from our parents, from what we studied all of our life. Uh, as I've said before, my, I never went to a church that actually taught a rapture or taught an antichrist or whatever. But I was interested in those books, so I read the, great, uh, the late great planet Earth. I never read the Left Behind books. That was after I learned to study myself. But prior to that, I read a lot of that stuff. And so my, my, uh, that was the spirit or that was the understanding that was in my mind. And that's what affected me. And there were many times where I was scared when uh, Israel had the seven-day war. I knew it was over with because they said that's what was going to happen. And I began to call my cousin and people and try to get them to give their life to the Lord because I was afraid everybody was going to go to a place called hell. So that, that's what was in me. And I was kind of like the Queen of Sheba. I had heard the first half of the story. I heard that Jesus died for us, but that's all I knew. I didn't understand the all-inclusiveness of it. I didn't understand the Pauline revelation where, you know, it goes into great detail explaining what Jesus did. So it literally, it's no understanding, and it's not seeing or being able to see with spiritual eyes or hearing with spiritual ears. I had a man on Facebook this morning post that, he was reading a scripture where Paul talked about the spiritual first and the natural, and he said all of a sudden that scripture proved to him that he's flesh. You know, and I wrote him back and I, and I said, you are not flesh. You're, he said he was of the dust of the earth. And I wrote him back and kind of slightly explained to him that the first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. The first man, Adam, became flesh, and flesh means religion or tradition. Flesh is any work of the flesh, trying to become something that you are. Jesus called it dead works. And so I told him, he wrote back, he said, well, last time I looked, I've got skin on me. So see, they're thinking flesh is skin, and they don't understand that they're spirit. So I wrote and I said, you need to pray that Father will help you see with your spiritual eyes. Paul prayed that we would, that we would really receive that. In other words, we already had it, but we need to receive it. We need to know that we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and we can see things spiritually. So it's the spirit of Babylon then. And it's not some kind of demon out there, some kind of devil. It's the conscience, it's the brain of confusion. And every one of us have had much time in our life where we were living out of confusion. And so 
they're carnal thoughts. They're not, we don't have a carnal mind, but we still have carnal thoughts. I still struggle with them. I'm sure you do too. It can be just one thing that's prevalent in your life that you struggle with. We don't beat ourselves up. We found out the way to rid ourselves of those things is just to feed on the truth. And so when the heart of mindset expo is exposed, and I left off with this, I'm going to read Revelation 19 again. When the heart of mindset is exposed to whom Sheba here typifies, the lack of knowledge that's driving her will be crushed. How do you crush lack of knowledge? You fill yourself up with truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. The word mindset, because that's what I call it, it's a heart of mindset. Not a heart of mind, but a heart of mindset. Somebody tell me some synonyms for that, or what, what you think the heart of mindset is. Two or three of you, tell me what a heart of mindset is to you. Can any of you? Yeah, thinking less than what we are. Thinking less than what we are? Thinking you're separate. Anytime you think you're separate from your car. Thinking that you're separate? Anybody else? Well, I looked it up today, and it's it actually, uh, the synonyms for a mindset mean attitude and outlook. A lot of people don't have a good outlook today. They think it's all, oh, it's going to be terrible. Bad attitudes. A mentality a belief system, a condition, or a frame of mind, and then also it's a mental uh, tendency, a mental tendency, you know, like somebody had this tendency that they blow off, they blow up real quick, they have this tendency to get mad or, or whatever, and then it can be a mental habit, all habits come from the mental realm, right? And to me, I believe with all my heart, if you have a habit that that, that is not a, a habit that is expedient for you, it usually comes from uh, a lack of drawing from the peace within. Because most habits are to try to get some kind of peace, right? Vanilla ice cream. <laughs> I know people laugh at that. But, you know, when I get all stressed out or whatever, I want to go get my vanilla ice cream. Some people, when they get stressed out, they want to go get their cigarette, right? Because it calms them down. And some people are even so bad that then they... Their, their habit becomes so bad that they get cocaine to calm them down, alcohol to calm them down, and then, uh, then sexual immoralities. It, it can just get bigger and bigger and bigger because none of that satisfies, right? right. And so what we want to do, uh, also it says it's a fixed state of mind. So some, some people, I mean, it's just fixed. It's planted and it's hard to get out. And that's why in Jeremiah, the Lord spoke to me, he spoke to Jeremiah to many other ministers, that there must be a plucking out, a tearing down, a pulling down, I mean, it's hard to get rid of some of these things, but it's not a hard work. It's, it, to me, what's hard is finding people who are willing to put their head on the chopping block of the Word and allow the be, truth to be poured in, and it goes to the very root of all these problems and digs it out. Psychologists can tell you that there are people that have things so deeply rooted in their brain, it's, they don't even know it's there. They, some things that happened so bad to them when they were young that literally their brain has protected themselves and it's hidden deeply there. And that's why Paul said, why is it that I do what I, when I would do good, I do evil? Because he said there is sin in my members. In other words, there's memories, there's thoughts, there's desires deep within the brain. But we have Holy Spirit. And we have the Word of God. And the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide asunder that which is of the spirit and that which is of the brain, the intellect. And literally, as we feed the Word, then we begin to say, well, that's a lie. This is a lie. It exposes the lie. And a wise person would say, you know what? I'm not believing that lie anymore. I'm not going to follow after that. So I said I was going to read this. I don't want to read this. I want to go on. We read Revelation 19, 1 last week. Mm -hmm. You guys might want to read it again. But it says in verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great poor. We used to think that the great poor was... Uh, in the beginning, I thought the great war was the Catholic Church. That's what people have taught for years, it was the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church did a lot of things that's anti-Christ, if you would, or anti-what Jesus did. They taught, but you know what? Then you're going to have to say it was this church and that church, because every church has a doctrine that's anti-Christ. Yes. Anti-Christ means they teach you other than Christ. If, if uh, John, I, I sit there and tell you, all you are is a sinner saved by grace, then I'm anti-Christ. If I tell you that you're not righteous, I'm antichrist. If I tell you that you need to do something to please God, that's antichrist. You know, we used to hear all the time, after all, Jesus did this for you, what can you do for Him? Well, He never asked you to do anything for Him. So if I tell you that you have to do something for Him, then I'm antichrist. If I tell you that you have to give your money to be blessed, I'm antichrist. Because you already are blessed. 
what I believe is you've got to you need to release your time and talent and treasure to release the blessing because you're already blessed but anything that you hold back dams it up right so the heart of the great horror is the brain the information in the brain that's what it is the information in the brain now I've seen something in the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, for many many years like all of us it was a mysterious book it didn't make sense I depended on people who were writing books making millions of dollars to tell me what it meant and finally I met Pastor Gary Garner and Lynn Howes and they began to show us some truths out of the book of Revelation and as our understanding has grown then the Lord's helped me to even write more and more explanation of it and it's basically nothing but a revelation of Jesus' redemptive work and who we are as Melchizedek priests, who we are as messengers that's bringing truth to the earth today. And so I've seen nothing in this book. The only thing that I see that really comes under a great judgment and fire is confusion. Would you agree with me? Yes. That's the only thing that's coming under judgment. There will never be another judgment from God on this earth or on people. He's not judging you for what you've done wrong. He's, uh, he's already judged you and He's judged you righteous. That's why God said in the Word that we are to be ministers of reconciliation and we are to judge people with righteous judgments. Righteous judgments, not sin judgments, not condemnation judgments or whatever. So Babylon, uh, the confusion is Babylon and the beast and the dragon, that's who's judged. And I, I was always taught that there's going to be some big old dragon come out of the earth someday and we're going to be seeing beasts and they're going to come hunt us down and if we don't turn our back on our father they're going to cut our head off I mean I was taught all that stuff and there's people who have been terrified about that but the beast to me is the full manifestation or the action of a person that does not or accept does not know or accept who they truly are that's a beast when you don't know who you are you're living as a beast there's two beasts in the book of Revelation there are beasts that are actually uh, messenger pastors that have understanding but then there's this beast and this dragon and this this mindset that's infected with religion and tradition and unbelief and unwillingness so that's the beast the dragon is the carnal thoughts that keep their uh, keep them chained to false perceptions and people are chained to that I mean I know lots of my Baptist brethren that say I was Baptist bred I was Baptist raised and I'll be Baptist till I die yeah. there are people in the Pentecostal realm that were raised Pentecostal and they uh, under the bondages and the rules and the regulations that's pronounced it on it and they live that way till they die so much so that it shows up on their faces I mean I grew up Pentecostal holiness and I never saw anybody happy and I'm not against anybody you know but you have to name some because it is the truth and then there are some denominations that it's just kind of like has a pan out theory. They go yeah. to church, they take their communion, they listen to the preacher, and they go and just whatever happens is going to happen. There's really no growing. They just have a fellowship that they attend. Right. And so we need to be freed from all that, from the good and the bad. Right? Because God doesn't want either. He wants Christ. And the problem is that they feed on that. They feed on that so it becomes a dragon. If you remember, in the book of Revelation, that hiss or that whisper, or that which is, was called a serpent, I mean in the book of Genesis, the hiss or the whisper that was called a serpent, yeah. it fed on what? What did it feed on? It crawled on its belly and fed on dust mm -hmm. all the days of its life. Dust. Well, what's dust? Dust is flesh. Adam was of the dust of the earth. He, and the Philistines were called dust dwellers. So they were feeding on flesh, and flesh is... Uh, religion and tradition it's rules and regulations it's called the arm of the flesh it's trying to get you to become something and you never can become by doing anything right you never can so that little that little uh, if you want to call it little snake which just pictures it what does it become when you get to the book of Revelation because it's been feeding on flesh for so long it's become a great dragon and what is it doing the the sun clothed woman the body of Christ it's the brain if you would the woman part of the brain the brain has understanding now and she's giving birth to the man child in other words we're not just a baby we have we already had the full grown nature of Christ and she's giving birth and that dragon is trying to devour it and it is really big to that it's big out there there's even finished work people that are preaching against these truths that are coming out today why because they're stuck yeah. brother Garner said 
the, the enemy to what you're preaching today are, are, are people who are stuck in what was preached yesterday. We yeah. never want to get stuck and say this is all there is to it. If it's all there is to it, then we might as well just quit. Might as well go on out there in the world and make it the best we can, and then when we die, we'll be with the Lord, and that's it. But there's much more. It, it is the inexhaustible riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this dragon and this beast, they need to be dealt with, like the dragon, their, their thoughts. But guess what? They're not tangible. Most of the thoughts of fear that you have are not tangible. What's tangible? It's something you can touch. Yeah. It's something that's real. Would you agree with me? Yes. Many yeah. things that we fear never came upon us. Right. Yeah. Just like Ruth. I mean, Naomi. She fe she heard a famine was coming to the land. And yet, she had a near kinsman redeemer that had all the money, all the food, everything that she ever needed. He would have never let her lack. He loved her. And here we are. We have a near kinsman redeemer, and that's our father. That's if you want to call say Jesus, that's fine. Our near kinsman redeemer. And how in the world can we ever fear what's coming on this earth? And the reason we do is because we don't know how much he loves us. There's a song, Oh, how, I think we sing it out here, Oh, How He Loves Us. People need to hear that. We have no clue how one, as John, you underlined that in the book uh, that Shaq revisited, and how one we are with Father God. We don't understand that, and we don't know. And I want to encourage you guys. How many of you read The Shack? Have you, okay, now you need to get The Shack Revisited. John can tell you who the author is. But get The Shack Revisited. It is so good. And it was a man that didn't even know the writer of The Shack, and he translated it. It's fabulous. I'm just I'm reading it so slow. Normally I could read that in a couple of days. I'm just taking one chapter at a time and just really gleaning on it. But there's a verse in there, I mean a chapter in there, where he was talking about literally how one we are. They're, they're, we are the plural of God. Yes. That does not mean that we're twins. Because twins have some, some different. You, even though they're identical, there's still something different about them. They're yes. individuals. But the plural of God means as God is, we are in this earth. And oh, how he loves us. Yes. And oh, how he would never separate himself from us. And oh, how he told the Apostle Paul, nothing can separate you from my love. And he told Jeremiah, he said, I know my thoughts towards man. They're thoughts of good and not evil. And to bring them to an expected end. In other words, to manifest the Christ life. But yet, what do we do? Oh, it's bad out there. I was with a guy yesterday putting windows in in our, my daughter's house. And all he was talking about how bad it is here in Oklahoma. And I said, you did, what are you talking about? You know, this is we are, our economy is awesome here. He said, yeah, but there's people out of work. I said, there's always people out of work. Yes. There's always businesses going under. They, they go under and they come up and they go under and they come up. Businesses fail. I mean, many times people have failed 10, 15 times before they finally hit success. That's no sign that it's bad. No. No. Look at our highways. There are billions and billions of dollars of cars driving around. Movie theaters, warm oh, theaters, yeah. never empty. No. Yeah. Restaurants, never empty. It's your perception. It's what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. So, we're not going under. Father's children have been reconciled back to Him. But the problem is that these thoughts control us. We perceive them to be real. We, we look at our memories and, and something happens and it triggers a memory. Uh, something happened to me last week and, uh, from a relationship and a family and that night I had this horrible dream. It just it triggered a memory. And I just say, Lord, take those memories out of my mind. I replace them with the truth. By faith they're leaving me. You know, and it all comes from fear, and it comes from the social realm. So, at the cross, when Christ, the new creation man, rose out of the grave, he was all and he was in all. Christ, the new man, defeated death, hell, and his resurrection, and that is the good news. Amen. Yeah. I had a guy write me today, a minister, that's me, unbeknownst to him, I'm mentoring him because he's still feeding off. And every once in a while he writes me a question. And he says, nobody out there has an answer for homosexuals or lesbians. He said, I read what somebody I wrote. So he wrote 25 statements to the church about homosexuality and lesbianism. And he said, it didn't satisfy me. And I want to know what you know about it. What have you written on it? And I've asked him to call me. But you know what I want to tell him? Nothing. You know, why are you concerned about that? Are you concerned about lying? Are you concerned about gossiping? Are you concerned about you maybe telling somebody that you shouldn't listen to Pastor Roy? Or are you concerned about, you know, why... 
do we think that we need to major on those things? I think nothing about it. I think that they're loved just as much as I'm loved. Yes. And I don't think it's an I'm okay, you're okay doctrine. No. And I think all of us need to come at the cross and feed on it and feed on it and let Father make us what He wants us to be right now. Amen. I do not believe that God made me to be what I've been for the last 62 years. I don't believe that God made somebody to be a homosexual or a lesbian or a liar or a rapist or a murderer or anything else. I believe we've lived out of a mistaken identity and many people have followed the flesh in different ways. But they're righteous, they're holy, and we say the Spirit and the Bride is saying, come and dine and feed and let's all become one. Yes. That's what I say about it. But yet people are, they have these thoughts that were put in their mind and they think we got to do something about it, we got to do something about it, we don't have to do anything about anything. Just like abortion. I know many of you done it. I've done it. I used to stand on the street corners, you know, with signs up and all that. That's not what we're called to do. The church is not called to preach against anything. We're not called to stand up against anything. We're called to feed and give out and feed and give out. We're called to, to love. So tell your friends that lack understanding. All they have to do is come to that cleansing blood. All they have to do is look into that brazen labor and let the water of the word and the revelation of judgment cleanse them and make them white as snow. Now, when I first typed that, I thought, well, I can't put that there because they already are white as snow. But they need to be cleansed. Not of sin. No. We could say of sin because sin is unbelief and sin is no knowledge. They need to be cleansed of the wrong information. And when they're cleansed of the, own, of the wrong information, then they're white as snow. They live that way. Just like my computer. Many, many times... I've had to take my computer in and have it cleansed in a sense. If you ever go on the internet, you're going to get spyware, you're going to get all kinds of stuff, you're going to get viruses, it's just going to happen. The more you search the internet, the more it happens. So every two or three months I have to take my computer in and say, hey, it's really slowing down, it's locking up, it's not uh, processing as fast as it's supposed to be, uh, blah, 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 and they'll go in there and they cleanse it and they'll find this virus and they'll find this spyware and they'll find this and they get it all out I get it back home. Man, it just, look at these split, it's just working just like that. Don't you wish they could do that to our point? <laughs> but we are. We are. The Holy Spirit's doing that. He's cleansing us. So the people of this world that are awakened, which we call alive in Christ, through spiritual understanding of the operation of God and the people who are asleep, which we call dead in Christ, they're still in Christ, but they're asleep, which is lack of knowledge, need to see what the Queen of Sheba saw. She saw wisdom. She saw a house. Remember Ezekiel, show the house the house. She saw food. Remember what Naomi heard when she went back? She said she heard that there was bread in the house of God. She saw food. She saw a woman, which is a soul or, or, or a position, excuse me, it's the brain. She saw it seated, in other words, at rest. She saw worshiping servants. And what were they doing? They were seeking to know more and more and have more understanding. She saw a righteousness that's provided by Jesus Christ. She saw an empty cup and she saw ascension life. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're seeing. What's the empty cup? When you come to Destiny Life Center, when you come to Tree of Life Ministries, we're not going to hold you out the cup of abomination. That's what the heart of does in the book of Revelation. That's what the brain, the intellect, holds out to you and says, Here, Ralph, drink this. This is what you did. This is who you are. Feed on this. Right? But the Bible says that Jesus said, If there, if there be any other way, Father, let that cup pass from me. Because I'm getting ready to drink the cup of abomination of everybody. Everything that Adam released, I'm getting ready to drink that. Can you imagine? I say this all the time to you. I can't even imagine that I had to take everything that just you guys have ever done or ever thought. Every fear that all of you have ever had. Just how many is in here? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. If I did, I couldn't take it. I would die right then. My mind would just probably explode. And Jesus took it all. We need to see the awfulness of what Jesus took into himself. And yet the heart of it, because we haven't seen it. And I read those scriptures last Sunday out there. Have you not seen? Have you not heard? No, we didn't. So because we hadn't seen and we not heard, we were never taught the Pauline revelation, any of us, right? We were never taught the six steps of the throne prior to 1996, any of us in here, none of us, most of you prior to just a couple of years ago. And so because of that, we've been slaves to the harlot, which is the brain and the religious system, and they've been saying, drink this, drink this, and we just take it. The preacher gets up there and preaches against sin, Yep, yep, I'm that, I did that. And that's how we fill the altars, and that's how you get people, quote, saved over and over and over again. 
You want to have a revival and you want to holler about how you got 25 people saved? Just get up there and start preaching people's sins. Preach them under the altar. And what are they going to do? They're going to crawl to the. They're going to crawl down there. And you know who they are? They're people that's been in your church for 15 or 20 years. It's your fault because you're not teaching them the truth. You keep reminding them who they are. Somebody needs to stand up and say, "Wait a minute! I'm not feeding on this stuff anymore. I'm getting out of here." You know, I'm righteous. I looked at the Bible myself, and I'm not dependent on what you tell me anymore. Right. I mean, it really needs to happen. People need to wake up. That cup is empty, and the only cup that you have is a, a gold cup of righteousness. It's a divine nature. That's what we feed on now. So it was provided by Father God, and then there is an ascension life. We've got to believe that. An ascension life, family, is when we learn that we can rise up above and live in the above realm, and there is divine favor there. You lack nothing there. I wasn't going to tell this, but I'm going to. <laughs> I, I'm having carpal tunnel surgery Monday, and I went in. Uh, first of all, I it really started firing up about three weeks ago, and my hand's gone completely numb. It's nothing major; it'll be taken care of. But I waited till the end of the year, and I don't want to go to next year because I'm going to start traveling. And I don't have time for it. Plus, all my deductibles are paid. So I thought, Lord, I need to get in now. So I began to call the doctor's office, and they said, "There's no way you can get in. No way you can get in. Not until late January." And I said, "Well, let me speak to Karen." Uh, that's his triage nurse, and and I told her I said, Karen, I need to, I need, I need favor from you, and I began to tell her, you know, I need to get this done this year. If I wait till next year, I'm not going to get to get it done, and it gets worse and worse. And the longer you wait, they can't fix it. So I began to just joke with them and play with them, and tell her I'd send her a box of chocolate candy, and you know me, I'm a persuader. Well, she said, okay, I'm going to get you. We have one appointment left. So she got me in for Friday morning. Uh, at, at Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, I was thinking I could have the surgery Friday. They were going to try to do it for me for Friday. But when I got there, they said, we can't do it till Monday. And I said, well, Monday will work. And so they did the electrocardiogram on me. And when the electrocardiogram came in, they called me and said, Roy, we found a problem, which it's, it's not there. It's not there. But they said, it doesn't match up with your last two electrocardiograms, and it looks like you had a heart attack and you got damage to your heart. Now, if I didn't know what I know, yeah. Yeah. I'd be calling Butch and John and, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I said, that's not possible. That is no way that's possible. She said, well, I'm sorry, We're, we can't do the surgery. You have to go to a cardiologist. Well, how many of you think you can get into a cardiologist tomorrow? I did. I called. I mean, I'm just talking about favor, family. We have favor. And if we know who we are, see, uh, I, 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 uh, got some information on the Allison's water bill not too long ago and they're not supposed to give that out. And the lady said, well, I'm sorry, your daddy, I just couldn't resist him. I, I apologize. I you know, and they shouldn't be able to resist us. They should not. So called the cardiologist said, I have to get in tomorrow. I have to. She said, well, sir, we don't have an appointment until about three weeks from now. I said, it won't work, ma'am. I need you to help me. I, I need this appointment. And she looked and she said, oh, somebody canceled at 8.30. Come on in tomorrow morning at 8.30. But she said, you're still going to have to cancel your surgery because they cannot do that uh, stress test for at least a week. And I said, well, I still need to get in. So I got in and met with the doctor. And he said, well, Roy, he said, it does look like it. It looks like you've had a heart attack. And it looks like you've gotten heart damage. And he said, We've got, I, I cannot free for the surgery. We've got to go through all this process. It's going to take at least a week to two weeks. And I said, well, well let's see what we got to do. So he takes me to the lady to... Uh, check me in and make an appointment for that and he's standing there and he said see if you can get him in sometime after the seventh and she, she's looking on the computer and I said ma'am and he stops and she said what I said there'll be a fifty dollar tip for you if you can get me in today and he just goes huh started walking off and she looked and she said you know what yes. our first appointment canceled we can do it today <laughs> and he stopped and he said no way she said yeah we can do it today and he said well I still can't read it for three or four days you know, he was determined, yeah. you know. So I go through this whole procedure. Have, have you had a stress test before? Yes. And of course you have to go eat in between it. So I go through the whole procedure and the lady saying, she said, I'll try to get him to read it, but I don't think he will. And so I went to eat and I got uh, seven uh, chocolate smoothies from the restaurant to bring back to everybody. And I brought it to him and gave it to him. And I said, here, I said, enjoy this. And while you're doing it, think about how you need to get look up and do my reading today and he just laughed at me and walked away so I'll leave 
And at 1 o'clock, after they get back from lunch, 1.15, I get a call. And this lady said, Mr. Richmond, you are the luckiest man in the world. And he prayed really hard because when Dr. Ahmad walked in, he said, bring me Roy Richmond's uh, papers. And he read them and not a thing wrong and said, tell him that he can do the surgery. Now that's favor. Yes. 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 I expect it. And it's not arrogance. I expect it. I, and I wouldn't expect it for something I don't need. I don't expect it to win the lottery. And I don't expect it to try to get somebody to do something nice for me. But when there's a need in my life that, that needs to take place yes. just like this, yes. family, from the first appointment with a Dr. Langerman to there, it was supernatural. Yes. It just doesn't happen. And I'm having surgery Monday morning. Now, does it happen that quick? Yeah. It, I mean, in the norm, it doesn't. But it can if we realize yes. this is who we are. And it, I needed it to happen that way, and I, in my heart, I knew it was going to, and it just came together like clockwork. That's what we, we've got to understand that. We are more than we think we are. I'm talking about ascension life. I am talking about a life that's life that Jesus said I came to bring life and life more abundantly. That's the abundant life. Not having everything you need. But whatever is going to be there for tomorrow, it's just going to be there for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I did need to have that surgery Monday because most of my upper management is off work that week and I don't have anything to do. But the next week i got to get going. So there is an ascension life that we don't know about. We don't have to fear anything. Now let's see what she said in verse 6 after 1 Kings 10 6. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of the acts and of thy wisdom. So he, she heard this in her land. You think people are hearing about us? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. All Absolutely. over the world they're hearing about us. Absolutely. And there's other churches too. There's other places, but we're just us. But people are hearing about Tree of Life Ministries International. They're hearing about Destiny Life Center. They're hearing about it here. And the problem is there's people saying, oh, you better be careful with them. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't want to go. But see, when they come and see all this That's stuff, right. when they walk into this house, or they go on your job, and they see how you're not afraid. They see how you're living the ascension life. What do you think they're going to say? Well, what are you feeding on? What, what's different about you? Okay. And she said, how be it? I believe not the words until I came. See, the spirit of the bride is saying, come and see. They won't believe it until they come because there's plenty of enemy out there to tell them, don't listen to that fool. I hear it all the time. And my, uh, see, until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I had heard. Happier are thy men, happier are these thy servants. Man, can they look at you and say this? Can people look at you and say, these people are happy? Can they? I mean, that's what we want. We yes. want people to see us and say, yes. these people are happy and, and their prosperity. And it's not just money, family. Prosperity is understanding and, and knowledge. It's not about money. Right. No. Well, that heater's getting hot. Would you turn it down a couple notches, please? Happy are thy men, happier are thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. I'm telling you, if you can stand in what God's planted and you can hear the wisdom of God that's been taught and preached, it will produce happy, happiness in your life. There's one of the Proverbs, I forget what it is, but it says, Happy are they that can hear and understand the sounds of the feast. Yeah. Happy, fortunate, and well off is what it says. Happy, fortunate, and well off are those who can hear the sound of the feast. All can, but not all will. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel. We could just put the church there, or man, what I prefer to say, forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Now we know Solomon is a picture of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. He's a picture of Jesus. But that is also a picture of us because we're the plural of Father God. Are we not kings and lords over this earth? Yes. He said he's king of kings and lords of lords. Are not we the prince of this earth? We're here to rule and reign and we're here to minister in righteous judgment. So he's made his body to rule and reign with him forever. So let us seek to know more. Let us... Let us do what He enabled us to do by the work of His Son. Let us rule and reign over this earth right here. We can't change the earth until we rule and reign over this earth. We must rule and reign. We must begin to speak uh, speak to it. Uh, Donna, uh, uh, Christmas Eve began to get this raspy feeling in her throat, just raw, and just instantly just became raw. And she ended up in full fledged sick. I mean, coughing, hacking, she's still doing it. She's better, but she lost her throat. 
That started coming to me yesterday. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm better than Don, but it started coming to me yesterday. Well, i got to have that surgery Monday. I can't get sick. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to get sick anyways. But you know what? I just, I, I, first thing I heard is you're getting what Donna got. That's the first thing I heard is you're getting what Donna got. And immediately I said, I will not. I will not because the Christ is in me. I do not have time to get sick. I will not. And I just, I began to do what I knew to do. I, uh, I gargled with, uh, with mouthwash, you know, to, to protect my throat, to clean my throat. And I just began to speak to myself and I said, I am not receiving that. I'm not receiving that. Last night I got my CPAP machine on and put water in it for humidity. And you know what? This morning it's 99% gone and it's just going to leave. We, we need to rule and reign. We do not have to succumb to okay. these symptoms. We really don't. No, we don't. I don't have to succumb to carpal tunnel, but right now I just don't have to, I just don't have the faith yet, I guess, to speak to that. And I thank God for doctors, but there is a day coming in all of our lives where we are going to rule and reign over our health. I already rule and reign on my finances. You know that. Mm -hmm. I'm not wealthy in the natural realm, but I never lack for money. It, if it needs to be there, it's just there. Mm -hmm. I have a Tree of Life and Ministries account that I do a lot with in ministry, and you know, I'm going to tell you something, that has never gone empty. It's never had a huge amount of money, but it's never gone empty. It's always there. I, I, I give out of it. I bless people out of it. I buy some of our supplies out of it. But it's just like yesterday, I had written a check and it was $38.50 left in there. Or excuse me, Thursday. Friday morning, got a check for $300 from a man I haven't talked to in two years. And then a lady from the Netherlands sent $100 by PayPal to the ministry. It happens all the time. That's called true supply. Now our father wasn't up there saying, oh look at Roy's checkbook, it's getting low. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just a spiritual principle. It never goes empty. Remember the story of the woman, Elijah, was it Elijah that came to the woman that was ready to eat their last meal with her son and die? Yeah. And yeah. he comes to the mill barrel and he says, feed me. And she said, I only have enough to make one cake. And he says, feed me. And she did it. She was obedient. And that that barrel never emptied out. Mm -hmm. It didn't stay, say it stayed full, no. but it never emptied. See, we want ours to stay full. We want to be the million dollar lottery winner. We want to live in a mansion, you know. We want to drive Mercedes. We want all that stuff. I'm telling you, you can drive the dumpiest car there is and it'll never die on you. Yes. Yeah. You just do what you're supposed to do. Put the oil in it. Treat it nice. You don't have to have a brand new car to be blessed. Right. No. But I don't believe you want you to drive a dumpy car either. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's just a spiritual principle. That's the ascension life. That's what she saw. She said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee. He's delighted in us. He loves us. We're his beloved. You know, do you, do you look, look at me. Do you think I let Donna live in rags? Do you think that I, that I don't take care of my wife? I, I do the best I can to, to bless her, to make her happy. And I, I'm proud of my wife. And I love my wife. How much do you think your father thinks about you? Yeah. Well, then why do people live that way? Because they don't know who they are. They see themselves as separate. So because they see themselves as separate, in a sense, they are separate. They see themselves as sinners, and they're not, but in a sense they are because they see themselves. As you see yourself, that's how you're going to live. What we want you to do is rise up to see yourself living in this ascension life. So, we want to be the body of Christ that can touch this world that the, the Father, Creator, Spirit can touch the world through. If not now, then when? I always say that. What do you want to wait for another generation for? Why do you want us to bury you in the ground like we did Carol the, the, the other day or turn her to ashes? Why? She didn't want that. Carolyn wanted to live. Man, she knew these truths. You know, so I say we must press in even harder. People are looking for answers and looking in all the wrong places. The church, for the most part, has not given the truth. I love the church. And actually, family, the church is not these buildings. The church is people. I, I should start putting down there, Elaine, the religious systems. The religious systems of the world, there is very little truth in any of them. And that is going to get stone thrown at me for saying that, but it's the truth. I don't know any religious system that's preaching truth, they're, pre they're preaching religion. Their teachers get their literature that's given to them by their hierarchy, and that's what they preach from. I know preachers, John, that on Saturday night they open up a book and it says, uh, what is this? Uh, this is the first week of January, so you go to the first week of January coming up. That's the sermon you're going to preach next Sunday. You don't listen to the Spirit. You don't 
wait to hear something, you preach whatever they tell you to preach. And bless God, if you vary from that, you lose your license. And so because of that, they've not reflected the message of the gospel. The message is Jesus Christ. The message is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father wants men to be who they are, and that is the image of Him. It's time for the queen, the soul, uh, come to a clear understanding of the cross. What needs to happen, that's what needs to happen. What's going to happen, that's what is going to happen. Amen? Well, I'm going to go ahead and quit. It's a little 15 minutes early. We'll start the next one next week. Unless y'all want me to go on, I think this is enough for today. And maybe we can do some discussion in here or whatever, some things that you learned. So, God bless you. Uh, uh, that's watching by way of the internet. We appreciate you. If you'll look in your email today, you'll find this uh, chapter 7 on the, the virtuous woman experience until she gives a portion to her maidens. Uh, I've had two or three people write me on this that it's the best that we've ever put out. I think they all are. <laughs> but uh, I think it's pretty good and I think you're going to enjoy it. God bless you. Keep sending your emails.